Hello, I am Katsarina, associate at Suranian Belarusian office. And today, together with my colleague Raul, associate from Estonian office, we start with Suranian arbitration series, the interview with arbitration institution who consider Belarus and Baltics as their target market. And today we are very, very happy to introduce you, Alice Freemus Wolf, the Secretary General of Vienna International Orbital Center. Alice, hi, nice to see you. Hello, Katharina and Raul. It's a really pleasure for me to be here. A very warm welcome um, from Vienna. And um, it's a great honor to participate in that uh, series with such nice um, uh, companionship. Hmm. Hello, everybody from my side as well. Uh, let's get this started, I think. Yeah, um, there is an old saying that behind every great man, there is a great woman. Uh, well, in the modern arbitration world, uh, we've noticed that there is a great woman behind every great arbitration institution. For instance, uh, secretary generals at the SSC uh, and ICSID and at also at VIAC. Alice, uh, could we start with a bit of a personal question? Uh, tell us about your path to become the secretary general of uh, VIAC. Uh, yes, with pleasure. What a, what a very nice comparison. I really like that and I have to remember it. Um, <laughs> Well, in 2018, um, I was appointed uh, Secretary General um, of VIAC and I had joined the institution back in 2012 as a deputy. Prior to that, so like between 2005 and 11, I was teaching at the Vienna International uh, at the Vienna University. Um, I was uh, sort of uh, coaching the Wismut team and that was actually the time also when my three kids were born. Um, and that was basically the reason why um, I decided then to join the institution because my prior profession being a lawyer didn't very well match with, match with my uh, personal situation um, as, I, as I had it. I used to be um, a lawyer in Vienna, uh, specialized in arbitration. Uh, I studied in Vienna and also in London and well actually arbitration was always the one thing that I was interested in. Uh, my first case was in 1995 when I was still an intern in a law firm and it was between a tractor manufacturer um, in the Czech Republic and in Italy and our client was in Italy and I had to travel to Milan and well I just thought wow this is this is so cool and ever since I sticked with with arbitration. So this is it in a nutshell my addiction <laughs> to arbitration. Well, I see that uh, for these eight years, almost in Bayek, you seem to know it back to front. And therefore, kind of for provocative questions, which three advantages would you consider to be, um, like, to allow the parties to choose Bayek as their institutions? Hmm. That is, uh, that is a difficult one, but uh, I try to figure out the three, for me, the most the three selling points of VIAC. First of all, I think we have very flexible and lean rules that really allow the parties and the arbitrators to tailor the arbitration to their needs. So there is no compulsory terms of reference or any other um, issues enshrined in the rules that, that make it almost like a, a, like a litigation. Second, uh, I think it's cost. Uh, basically, parties uh, become more and more um, cost sensitive and um, we have a um, schedule of fees for arbitrator fees and also for administrative fees that is especially in the lower segment and not all the cases are about 100 millions, um, uh, really have a good balance between um, giving the arbitrators a fair share of their work but also allowing um, the parties uh, to being able to, to fund it. And the third one um, is the conscious decision against emergency arbitration. And what would be the reason behind the, such decision against emergency arbitration? Well, I know that um, emergency arbitration has become quite popular. A lot of institutions have adopted rules and already back in 2013 when we um, had 
the very big um, overhaul of our rules. And again, in 2018, when we had the next revision, we discussed it and we came to the conclusion that just because everyone is having it doesn't mean that we need to have it too, because we have uh, reasons. And first of all, we think it's a very costly exercise, especially for the parties. Um, second, um, and, and maybe this is even more important, there is really a lack of enforceability of the emergency arbitrator decision because it doesn't fall under the NOI convention. Of course, many institutions who have it report that parties comply voluntarily, but if not, you again have to involve um, the state courts. So our conclusion was, if you really need a freezing order, something urgent that needs to be enforced by the courts, uh, you have to resort to the state courts anyway. And in our region, um, state courts work very well when it comes to interim injunctions. And that's why we said, OK, um, that's what differentiates us from the others. And um, that's that are the reasons for it. Well, this is very reasonable indeed. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to the hot topic of 2020. Uh, a couple of questions regarding COVID-19 related changes. Um, we had a shocking beginning to the year. Uh, me personally, I've never seen anything like this before. And I suppose that it uh, sees the number of incoming cases for VIAC as well. Uh, have you regained these numbers by now? And uh, what is the current uh, caseload dynamic or overall situation? Well, indeed, um, the lockdown was something that took us all by surprise. And uh, we as institutions, we uh, really had to adapt from one moment to the others. And I think what we really all the institutions manage to do well is to reassure parties that we continue to be there, that the cases can go on. So with respect to, to those cases who were pending, um, there was no disruption. Of course, some um, oral hearings were postponed or um, situations um, were adapted. Um, but for new cases incoming, we really saw a quite of a halt in that total lockdown period. But in the summer, it started to pick up again. And now we see cases sort of coming in and we expect quite a big wave of new claims in the autumn when a um, couple of measures that had been introduced by the governments uh, will cease mm -hmm. to exist and um, uh, simply the companies will feel will feel the pressures. So at the moment we have around uh, 50 pending uh, cases, which is pretty much the number that we that we that we have on average. OK, OK, uh, let's discuss the technical part of uh, COVID related changes. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of the new normal today is uh, a possibility to work internationally, uh, despite uh, being we all being locked in a home, home office, for instance. So uh, arbitration institutions uh, respond to that in, uh, have responded to that by introducing uh, new IT, IT features. Uh, like special platforms for the exchange of documents. Um, uh, what about uh, VIAC? Has COVID-19 changed uh, your IT thinking? And how do you keep up with uh, recent trends? Well, I think um, that is one of the issues that all institutions need to take care of. And I think um, COVID has just accelerated um, a process that all of us have started. For example, in 2018, we introduced our electronic uh, database for the case management. And that really allowed us from day one to to day two to completely uh, switch uh, to remote working without making any difference to the parties in the pending cases because each of the case manager could work from home, does have access to the electronic filing system and um, may simply continue its work without disruption. That would have been a couple of years ago when we still had the paper files, you know, by hand that were put on, on my table, that it would have been impossible. So this is um, step one. And then uh, our decision that we wanted to um, introduce a platform that was enhanced um, by, by COVID pandemic. And we're currently negotiating uh, with providers to be able to offer uh, a platform for exchanging documents for each arbitration case that is being filed with VIAG um, as of beginning of next year. So the plan is, that there will be no emails, 
um, mm -hmm. statement of claims will be uploaded to a special platform um, in order also to comply with security measures. And uh, I think this is simply the, the way for the future. Okay. And this the third... Is... Oh. And actually the third, sorry, the third and last step is then taking care of um, awards, sending or rendering award also electronically, affixing secured electronic signatures because in the in the worst lockdown period, imagine you have three arbitrators in three different countries. Um, the postal services is not working. How can you get those signatures uh, physically over to Vienna? So we are working also on that. And then the only thing that remains is to make these electronic awards, awards also enforceable. And mm -hmm. maybe the Hague Convention will be uh, able to develop uh, an instrument that will also guarantee enforcement and recognition of such electronic awards. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, um, Katrina. Well, Alice, now I suggest to dive a little bit into the VIA internal processes. And the parties do normally have their counsel to help them present their case. And uh, what about arbitrators? Does VIA support them in the how in the course of the proceedings? Well, first of all, we have um, a complete mirror file stored uh, in our electronic database that means that every correspondence between the arbitrators and the parties we also receive so we can really follow the proceedings from the beginning to the end um, and we take the monitoring quite seriously uh, but not in a negative sense sort of chasing arbitrators but also assisting them there are very often situations um, that have not arisen before at least for those arbitrators and we have great experience so we stand ready to to spare with the arbitrators and find solutions uh, which we have done especially now in the in the COVID cases with deciding virtual hearings how can we do this postpone and so on we have also written guidelines for arbitrators that really include um, proceedings from the beginning to the end and provide them with some information what we expect um, and, and also uh, tell them that we do a light scrutiny of the arbitration award in the end. Um, checking formalities, trying to look for those sort of faults that might trigger a correction or explanation of the award, and we really want to reduce this to a minimum. Um, and uh, we have had very positive responses to this. And, um, you know, in terms of monitoring, we have uh, implemented in the rules two, two mechanisms where if the arbitrators are especially efficient, I can increase um, the amount of their fees by up to 40%, mm -hmm. but also reversely, I can decrease their fees by 40% if there's really uh, a delay that is not explainable. But so far I have not uh, <laughs> needed to use it, but it's always good to have it. Well, like is a good place for arbitrators too. <laughs> And what about young arbitrators? Is there any like special approach to them? Well, um, we have a very positive approach toward young arbitrators. We really try to give as many young arbitrators first time appointments where possible um, because we we have made the experience that especially the, the younger colleagues that have experiences as uh, arbitral secretaries have been part of a team uh, and seen arbitrations from the council side they are very ambitious they're on top of the case um, they don't really need that much of assistance in in the sense that they don't know what to do but of course we we are especially there for them to help them with um, sort of procedural issues that they might not be so familiar with but i have had very good experiences hmm. okay i have a question regarding uh, vienna rules mm -hmm. uh, some institutions uh, opt for having an additional appellate mechanism in the rules uh, what are your thoughts on such procedure? Have you ever thought of anything like, uh, like adding anything like that uh, for VIAC? Well, I'm aware of these discussions and to be very honest with you, I'm not a very big, big fan of this appellate system. I can understand um, why parties want it, uh, but again, uh, I think that's one of the advantages and really selling points of arbitration and has always been 
the finality of the awards, award and the immediate enforceability. So if you put an appellate mechanism, it will just prolong the proceedings because I really don't see any party or any council that loses the case not using the appellate mechanism and um, that will just add another layer and I think it will make arbitration much more litigation-like. True, definitely. Who would not use the appellate procedure if it's there, right? Um, but and moving on, uh, yeah? Yes, sorry. Well, mm -hmm. And regarding the enforcement of the award, Alice, does WIAC monitor it anyhow? Well, we would love to, but um, on that part, I would need uh, information from, from the parties. Um, usually, we get information about enforcement awards only when, when after the successful enforcement um, uh, parties or arbitrators come back to us or we meet them at conferences and they tell us, listen, we have won that award and we have also enforced it and they are very happy about it, but uh, there's no statistics on it because it's simply too too difficult. We would have to chase the parties and I don't, I con don't consider this um, appropriate. But generally speaking, um, I have heard from the market that VIAG awards are very well received um, abroad, which also has to do with, with the appearance and the way our awards are being made. The VIAG is part of the Austrian Federal Economic Chamber, which is a public legal entity and as such um, has the authority uh, to use the Austrian state emblem. So we have really formalized our awards to look very judgment-like. It has a big emblem um, on the front page, it's being bound, um, it has an, uh, a seal, uh, it bears that eagle, um, it also bears my signatures uh, certifying that this is an award rendered by the arbitrators on our rules and all these little pieces, it's almost like a handy handcraft work, uh, really helps uh, because usually a state court judge in a rural area that, that gets that or is presented with that award might not be aware of arbitration and, and th the official character has been very um, helpful. And there's another state where we get involved as institutions because sometimes parties for the enforcement, they need um, apostilles, they need notary signatures and we also assist in that. So it's very frequent that I go to the notary and have my signature um, being notarized. Okay, and regarding the expedited procedure provisions that are in the VIAC rules as well, did they prove to be in demand for these years? Well, again, uh, the expedited issue is something that was um, very much on vogue a couple of years ago when um, institutions looked for, for ways how to accelerate proceedings in order to save time and costs. And there are two different mechanisms, the opt-in or the opt-out mechanisms, and in addition, having a monetary threshold or not. Viac has opted uh, for an opt-in system without any monetary threshold for the very reason um, and I think that's different from each institutions. As I said before, there's not only these 100 million euro cases um, that needs big attention but also smaller cases but they might still trigger very difficult legal questions and are very important for that parties. So putting them into a situation where they would automatically just by the monetary threshold fall in expedited proceedings, we did not think this to be a good idea and we made a survey in the market and the response from the parties was uh, that they did not want this because if they want expedited, they can include this provision in the arbitration agreement, they can even agree when the arbitration has started, which sometimes happens, but they don't want to fall in this automatically because expedited means that not only the arbitrators have to be fast for rendering a word, but also the parties in their council have to be very fast in submitting um, briefs. And this is very often um, difficult. So in comparison to other institutions, our statistics to, with respect to expedited numbers are much smaller mm -hmm. because we don't have this, this threshold. But I can say those who are being deliberately chosen work very well. And in general, the VIAC proceedings um, last for about one year when the um, file is being transferred uh, to the arbitrators until the rendering 
of the award, which for most parties that we deal with is still considered very fast. Okay, thank you for this transfer. Uh, Alice, we're already grateful for your time, but uh, one last question, a bit of a subjective one. Uh, what is your advice to attorneys representing clients in uh, arbitration proceedings? Well, um, maybe the one, one, one thing that I would really like to stress is that the counsel should always act in the interest of the client, meaning don't do their own thing um, and really look what is the best option for the party in that particular moment. Maybe it's it's a settlement. Um, maybe it might be that even mediation is, is a better option than arbitration. And I think it's really the duty of a good counsel to to talk with the client and really detect what, uh, what the client needs. Then the other thing is um, don't play every card available to delay or obstruct proceedings. Um, of course, it's every party's right uh, to, to uh, protect itself, to object um, and to use mechanisms available, but they're the ones who we all know will not be successful in that particular case. And it can really lead um, that the, the arbitrators have a very bad impression of that party or of that council if any and all measures are being used. And I think um, that cannot be in the interest of the client as well. Then also know the arbitration rules of the institution that you're dealing with. Uh, they are very alike meanwhile, but there are some differences. Uh, and I think that's the duty of the arbitrator to, to uh, of the council, sorry, to really are familiar with the rules and um, always act fair. The arbitration world is a small world and we encounter each other in different scenarios. Now you're a counsel, next time you're an arbitrator and vice versa. So always be aware of that. And the last one um, I like the most is be firm in the matter, but still friendly in tone. After all, we are human beings. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Alice, thank you very much. Uh, it has been great pleasure to have you here with us uh, today. And uh, dear friends, we were here today with the Secretary General of Vienna International Arbitral Center. Uh, thank you all for listening and we welcome you to join us on the next episodes of Sorin Arbitration Series. And goodbye. <laughs> thank you. Goodbye. Bye.